morning, everybody. I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored that you're here. When I found out that two weeks ahead of schedule we closed things out, I thought, well, people are interested in this subject. Of course, the relentless pursuit of major gifts is a subject uh, that's preoccupied me for the last 20 years, and I look forward to sharing thoughts with you. But more than that, ideas, I want ideas to stimulate for you, right? We want, we want ideas to begin percolating. How many of you have been at this work for a long time? How many of you have been at this work for a shorter period of time? So I think for us old fogies, I think what, we, what you want to think about is, where are the pearls of wisdom? Where's that aha idea? Some of this is going to be review for you, but I'll tell you what, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment, I never get tired of reviewing the basics. Because really, you know, it's not rocket science. Fundraising is a very, very simple proposition. And I believe most anyone can become a very, very effective fundraiser. And we're going to show you how today, or at least suggest ideas as to how to do so. But I want to, I'm very, very honored to have my, a number of colleagues from uh, the University of Missouri-St. Louis. This is kind of like a training program for us. And I'd like all my colleagues from UMSL to please stand. So this story is really their story. In fact, it's Brenda McPhail's story back here, Dr. Brenda McPhail, who's Associate Vice Chancellor for University Development. How many years, Brenda? 20 plus years? Going on 21 years. Brenda's kind of our, our, our bastion of institutional knowledge. She's an incredible fundraiser. She should be up here doing this. And I was able to join forces with Brenda seven years ago about, and we've made some great things happen. Also, you'll notice there's some cameras. What we're doing is we're, we're videotaping, and we're going to edit the material down. This is a crew from UMSL, led by Jim Fay. I don't, Jim's back in the corner. And uh, our media studies professor, who does great work for our university. And we're going to upload this to a, a new website called, drumroll, martinleifeld.com. On that website, we'll have these videos, so you can refer to them or let other people know they're available. And also, awaiting you on that website are 16 videos called Five Minutes for Fundraising. They're really five to ten minute videos on various subjects of fundraising, some of which we'll talk about today and other subjects. So if you want a quick hit, a quick bit of encouragement, you go, you click on it, and in ten minutes you go, all right, I'm ready to rock and roll. That's why I watch them every day. <laughs> so. Uh, Getting going, I arrived at UMSL in August of 2008, and the sun was shining back in those days. It was a glorious time. I was so, I was so, I hear the birds. It was such a very exciting time. I, I was pumped, hired by the chancellor. As Amy mentioned, I had a number of responsibilities, but I was hired really as a fundraiser. Um, and I met with the chancellor on Monday, August the 4th, said, Chancellor, what are the overriding priorities? He said, well, Martin, uh, recruitment is flat. We need to improve our marketing, and I want you to take the campaign public. So there was a campaign that was underway, the first campaign in the history of this young university, and uh, we needed, I was supposed to help do something with this. So over the next several months, we evaluated, we reorganized. Those who were with us in those days, Brenda in particular, we had you know, all kinds of org charts up on the walls, and, and you know, we, we recruited some new people began coming in. Some folks decided that uh, they wanted to go elsewhere and, and work, and we got going with great optimism. But then, thunderstruck, the Great Recession. It's like it's August, the sun's shining, September hits, and oh my God, the sky. Now, any of you remember the Great Recession? <laughs> Do you remember that fall? If you had some retirement funds, remember them dropping by 25 to like 50% seemingly overnight? We were all absolutely struck dumb by that virtual economic collapse. Well, it's like, what, what to do? I mean, there were campaigns being suspended. There were campaigns being, not being launched or being postponed indefinitely because uh, who had any money to give? And I wrestled with that. I thought the easiest thing to do is tell Chancellor George it'd be foolish to go on with the campaign. We should suspend it. 
that'd be an easy way to make a dollar. But you know, I was struck one time in rustling through this, there was this article, and in the article, Robert Sharp Jr., who uh, runs a fantastic plan giving consultancy program, was quoted as saying, well, you know, in the Great Depression, in the Great Depression, with some institutions, more money was raised than before the Great Depression. That's all I needed to read. It, and I, he said, plan gifts were used more so than before the Great Depression. So that's all I needed this was permission from an authority to say, if somebody else could do it in the Great Depression at UMSL, we can do it in the Great Recession. And we really got seriously busy. So let's go to the key ingredients. There, there were a number of key ingredients that really drove the success for the University of Missouri-St. Louis. We realized that major gifts, and that's why we're here today, would lead to success. It was a young institution in the 40s, mid-40s. Universities that are in the mid-40s, as we were at that time, your oldest alumni are only now kind of reaching that point where they've accrued the resources, they're starting to think about giving back. We had virtually no alumni re re uh, of size support in those days. We relied on corps and founds like many of your organizations rely. And we needed, we ha the only way we were going to raise the kinds of sums of money that we wanted to raise was going to be through a significant focus and effort around major gifts. So uh, my predecessor, Tom Eschen, who had launched the campaign the first three years, went on from, to Maryville, where he's doing great work there. And uh, he had some boards up on his wall. I took them down, and I, I had our folks create this board. Now, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe it's in the notes. But what I've got is uh, our major gift focus. And I did take out, somebody asked for a raffle for major gifts. I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but I, I erased out the prospects' names. But this was from January 19th this year. And we've got what I call uh, $8.5 million of gifts underway. This is only $250,000 and above. And then on the right, gifts to close, and we have the possibility of nearly $30 million. Up above, we raised $31 million last year, a new record. I'd like to see us top that at 32. On January 19th, we're at $13.66 million. Like, man, we've got a long ways to go if we're going to match last year. But that sits and everybody knows who works with me, sits directly across from me. Every time I look up from my desk, that's there. I turn around from my computer, that's there. People come in to see me, we talk about what's up there. And just the simple tool as that helped keep me focused, and has kept me focused for six and a half years, and I think at least symbolically has helped all of us who are doing major gift work at UMSL to stay focused on what matters most. We'll get to the point about we have only so much time in the day, in a week, in a month to devote to major gifts, what to do about it, but how we do it has everything to do with success and a relentless pursuit is all about it. We did some other things. We created, a, uh, we established what we call floors for support. Establishing floors. So the university had what was called the Auguste Chateau Society. And this was cumulative giving for individuals at $100,000. So, but they gave you 5,000 bucks, they pledged another 10,000 bucks, they did a bequest for 85,000 bucks, they're at 100,000 bucks cumulatively, we would recognize them. But we had nothing above that. So we created what we called Partners for Greatness, which was a million dollar giving level. And uh, there were, uh, in the first three years of the campaign, we had raised $48 million, 48 and change, and there were three seven-figure commitments three seven-figure commitments. So we created the Partners for Greatness, not just for individuals, but for organizations too. Another powerful ingredient as we got going was being able to rely upon George Paz. I don't know if you all know George. George is chairman and CEO of Express Scripts, the largest company in the state of Missouri, a Fortune 20 company. And George is a graduate of our university, and he was the chair of the campaign. And we were able to activate George and take George on, I don't know, maybe seven, eight to ten calls, which were very, very powerful calls. And the George pause ingredient, I, I'll, never, I'll never underestimate George. Then we got busy. We went out and began meeting and soliciting. 
And we'll talk about that process in a minute with, with, with some real consideration. But we got out and began talking about UMSL, the campaign, and we need your support. And people began having to make decisions about what we were talking to them about. Gift announcements. We used gift announcements as strategically as possible to bring, build awareness in St. Louis. We wanted St. Louis to know, and since the vast majority, 80, 80 plus percent of our graduates live in the St. Louis region, we wanted them to know that UMSL was raising money and that people were making serious investments in UMSL. And up in the upper left-hand corner is uh, Chancellor Tom George, David Peacock at that time, president of uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev, and Dean, at the time, Dean Keith Womer, who was dean of our business school. And you remember the AB InBev story. Right before that deal was consummated, the gift committee of Anheuser-Busch met, and they made some allocations. One was $2.5 million to Amsel. But because of the purchase, the sale of the company, that kind of gift announcement was strictly embargoed, could not be communicated. So Bob, Bob Samples is over here, our, our communications executive. Bob, through back channels, was talking to the folks at Anheuser-Busch that when they were in a position to come out and talk about philanthropy, could we do it around the announcement of the gifts that they were making to Upsell? And if you remember, all of us in the community had considerable angst about Anheuser-Busch. They were, they were giving away 20 million bucks a year. Many of us lived on Anheuser-Busch money. Was it going to go away? What's going to happen with InBev with InBev and their possession of Anheuser-Busch? Would they still be so supportive in the community? Would they support our organization as they have in the past? So we, f we had finally the event. It was, I think, like February 9th, 2009. On our campus, this happened, honest to God, it was global news and moments. Uh, all the stations and uh, television and radio were announcing it. We had significant coverage there. It, were, it went on the wires. It went everywhere because the world wanted to know. And here it was in the first sentence, UMSL, um, so $2.5 million, Anheuser-Busch. Could you get, have it any sweeter than that? Everybody paid attention, and we were able to use that gift to elevate that, hey, something's going on at UMSL. They're raising money at UMSL. So using, using gift announcements was part of our strategy, and finally building towards our Founders Dinner. We have a Founders Dinner typically in September of every year where we recognize distinguished alumni. We recognize faculty and staff who have had significant 10-year uh, milestones. And usually a speaker would be brought in. So in the first one, uh, fall of 08, I uh, you know, kind of observed this all and thought, this thing needs to be different. So what we did is we decided we were going to focus on donors in a major way and recognizing and honoring donors. And those who were in the Augusta Toast Society or were to reach partners for greatness, we would have them on the stage with uh, gifts, recognition, photographs, all that stuff in front of... Uh, what I would call an, an UMSL rock and roll crowd of 800 people plus over at the Ritz-Carlton. So what were the early results? You can see that uh, under, in the first few years with Tom and Brenda's leadership, 48 plus was raised. That first year, by June 30th, we raised 26.6. That was a, over a 50% increase over the previous high. And when we announced that, that got the buzz going, too. I was interviewed by national publications. Uh, the chancellor was as well. People just couldn't believe it because nobody, how did you do that? How did you raise 50% more in this environment when nobody has any wealth anymore and people were afraid to part with what little wealth they had left? But we weren't done yet because we were going to founders. We raised money like crazy in July and August into September, and when we announced the campaign, we announced a $100 million goal, and I was up on the stage. I watched jaws drop at um, so $100 million. And then when we said we were at $83 million that day, the jaws dropped again. It was just in a, one of those amazing moments that, oh my God, look at how people believe in the value of this institution. 
And in addition to the three uh, seven-figure gifts that had come in earlier, we had added 10 more by that time, and we recognized 13 partners for greatness. And this picture here, you'll see in the background, Chancellor George is at the podium. A number of our partners for greatness are in the background, and that is Des Lee. Des was unable to come up on the stage to receive his partners for greatness gift because he was far along in age. And I believe this turned out to be his last public speech. Several months later, he passed away. And Des, as you know, was just a remarkable philanthropist here in the St. Louis region, was an extraordinary, singular donor to our university. So, you know, the following June, we were going to be at $100 million two years early. Some people were saying, call it quits, man. <laughs> Celebrate it. But as we talked about, it's like, well, we, we kind of raised $25 million the first year, so a little bit more. We raised more or less $25 million the second year. If we could go on and raise $25 million for the next four years, maybe we could, in effect, create this floor of $25 million overall and create a pace, a pattern, a rhythm of activity that could sustain $25 million. So we, we went to the chancellor, and he concurred. We raised the goal to 150, and you know, we did it publicly. Now, someone said they get exhausted in this work. We were exhausted doing this work. It's exhausting work raising money, raising money over seven years, raising money with the pressure of public goals. But of course, it's incredibly rewarding and satisfying, too. All right? It's a roller coaster ride, granted, but what a roller coaster ride it is. So we went to 150. How did we do? Well, back in the old days, the early days, four and five, we were raising about seven million bucks a year. Then in the campaign, we hit 154. You'll see that we had a, a nice jump in those first three years as the campaign got going, and then we were able to take it further still. And since with fiscal year nine and onwards, we've been able to average 26, sustain 26.2 million dollars a year. So going from seven to an average of 26.2 and sustaining it over four years, that's growth of 375%. Would you take that and run? Right? So this is what I want to say. Oh, and we've got you know, 31 partners for greatness. We had three the first three years. We added 28 the next four years. 31 partners for greatness, 136 August Chateau Society members, that's $100,000 or more, significant commitments, 55,000 donors overall. You're here for some very, very important reasons. You're dedicating a morning, you actually forked up some bucks, granted you got a good cup of coffee. But, but you're here for very, very important reasons. You're here representing organizations that matter. They matter to you, they matter to the community, they matter to the world. And raising money for these very worthy organizations, and raising more money for these very worthy organizations, that's what you're all about. In fact, it's our responsibility. It's a goal, a desire we have. Sometimes there's specific mat matrices we have to reach. But we have these goals, we have these desires, and so we're here together as a learning community. I get the pleasure to say a lot from up here today, but I think what happens among you perhaps will be even more powerful. So share your stories, ask your questions, interact with each other, and let's learn today. I think many of you could be up here instead of me, because these are, these are uh, th concepts we're going to be dealing with today that many of you teach, many of you practice, perhaps far more effectively than, excuse me, than we do at UMSL. But I think we can all grow. Um, mastery. You ever heard that word, mastery? I think we're all challenged to be masters at major gift fundraising. fundraising. I'm challenged to be a master of it. But mastery is not something we obtain. Mastery is something we pursue. I don't think I'll ever be a master in fundraising. Why? Because the next donor is totally unique. And then the next donor is totally unique. And then the next donor is totally unique. And so we come with, and we'll talk about this, we'll come with our backgrounds, hopefully our effectiveness, 
and yet we present ourselves before and we engage with these donors. We're facilitators of philanthropy, representing our organizations, reaching out to donors, trying to find these powerful matches that will transform the lives of the donors and empower our organizations to do great, great things. Okay. Um, we're going to switch to the next topic, but while we do this, this is what I would like you to do. Turn to someone next to you and say, here's my takeaway from that talk. 